So for this week's Striper Season Update, brought to you by West Marine, we are coming to the end of the June new moon period. That's traditionally one of the peaks of the spring striper migration. You've got all the stripers in place, water temperature's perfect, a lot of bait fish moving around, and like you'd expect, there were a lot of very big striped bass caught this week. The best action seemed to be from Long Island, I'd say northern New Jersey, up through the North Shore of Massachusetts. Uh, some fish in excess of 50 pounds were taken on top waters by trolling, uh, guys fishing live bait as well. Uh, not just from the boats, some guys got some big ones in the surf. I know of one 51 inch fish taken out of the surf at Island Beach State Park in New Jersey on a piece of clam. In New Jersey, seems like the northern half of the state still has great fishing for big striped bass. South of, say, Barnegat Inlet, it's predominantly schoolie sized stripers with a couple slot sized fish still in the mix. A lot of those big bass that were in New Jersey are moving out and spreading out along Long Island. You've got big fish on the north shore of Long Island, good fish in the east end setting up off the north and south forks, and you have very big stripers moving along with bunker pods off the south shore of the island. Connecticut seeing some good fishing as well. Big stripers moving into the eastern sound now. Rhode Island fishermen still have good action in Narragansett Bay, but we're also starting to see some very big stripers on Block Island. It was an okay week on Cape Cod. Some fish definitely moved into Cape Cod Bay. Seems like we have some fish moving along the backside. The canal was quieter than you'd expect for the June new moon, but there's still a couple days left for these breaking tides, so something could happen this weekend. On the North Shore of Massachusetts and in Boston, some very big stripers showed up this week, fish in excess of 50 inches and 50 pounds. New Hampshire and Maine are seeing more slot sized fish with the occasional 40 inch fish mixed in. As good as the fishing was this week throughout parts of the Northeast, there were a lot of fishermen who talked about seeing very finicky stripers following lures, even live baits back to the boat. And in this week's striper season update, Kevin Blakeoff and I talk about finicky stripers, why they might be picky, and maybe how to turn those following fish into striking fish. Earlier this week, Chris Megan was down with Captain Joe DiOrio filming an episode for the next season of On the Wooders Angling Adventures that's going to air this winter. And they had great fishing with stripers throwing top wooders. I think they fished a little live bunker toward the afternoon and evening. And then at slack tide, the bite died. So they used that chance to throw up the drone, try to get some good shots of the top water working to add into the episode. And when they reviewed the drone footage later, what they saw, what they had no idea was there were wolf packs of stripers were coming up and following the dock, following the top water all the way to the boat, but giving no indication that they were there. The water was a little bit stained and they had no idea that the fish were following it until we looked at the drone footage the following day. And that's something I've been hearing a lot about this spring, of guys talking about stripers following live baits, following lures back to the boat without striking. I know Kevin Blinkoff here has dealt with quite a bit of that in his kayak, just dealing with finicky stripers that don't want to bite. And uh, Kevin, what have you been seeing out there? It seems like all spring. Yeah, I think it's something that happens more often than people realize, but you know, maybe it is more often this spring. And you know, when we talk about finicky fish, it's like, oh, you think of trout in a stream or or albies when they're on a ton of bait, they're feeding, but it's like you have to perfectly match the hatch. Um, and I, I think in general with stripers, it's not quite the same. It's not like they're looking for the perfect presentation or the exact match of the bait. It's like with striped bass, it seems to be very much kind of a mood or a time, or like you just mentioned that example, like a, a tide uh, situation where at slack tide or when conditions are at a certain way, these striped bass, for whatever reason, get really finicky and decide they're not going to feed. Um, what I've noticed a lot this spring, and like you mentioned in kayak fishing, I fished from an old town kayak that I can stand up in. And I was doing a lot of fishing sitting down and, and spooking fish. So I would be, you know, kayaking along, see swirls, spooking stripers. I knew they were fish in the area. And I thought they were just totally ignoring everything I presented. Once I stood up in the kayak and, and the sun was out, um, had the polarized glasses on and I could see what was going on, I realized the fish were actually following the lure, following the fly, whatever I was throwing. Um, they were just sort of, you know, I, I described it as sort of like escorting it. They didn't seem to want to eat it. They just seemed to want to make sure that it got all the way back to the kayak just fine. And then they would swim away and they were doing it over and over again. Um, and they were good sized fish too. So it was a little painful, but you know, I've, I, I went back, I tried different lures, tried, like I said, I tried flies. I tied some flies specifically to try and fool these fish. Um, and nothing really seemed to work until I went back on another day, the weather was different, the tide was different. And for whatever reason, all of a sudden on this day, the fish were there and they weren't picky at all. So 
again, I, I don't know if you would agree with that, but I think that that's a lot of times what's going on with these picky fish, picky striped bass is it's a, a timing or like a mood type thing. Yeah. So if I never boat fished or kayak fished, I've, I've been out there in days and seen that exactly what you're seeing in my kayak, but most of my striper fishing I do from shore. So I've always believed that basically if, the, if I'm not catching stripers, it means the stripers aren't there. Not, not that I'm that good, but I mean, striper aren't as picky as trout. So if, if they're there and they're around and they're in, in range of shore, I always think you're going to catch them. But when you go out in a boat, you know, and you're using electronics, especially uh, side scanning sonar, and you see how many bass are around and they're just not always feeding. You know, it would, it would probably be maddening to know how many nights that you're casting over fish from the beach and uh, that they, they're just not willing to eat. Yeah. So let's, let's kind of talk about then if you, if you know, or you think there are stripers in the area and you're not getting, you know, whatever you're doing, you're not getting hit, that you're not getting bites, they're being finicky or picky. Um, what are some of the things that you can do? I mean, I, I, I think of some nights we've been out surf casting and you're convinced that you're feeling bumps or you're feeling a fish behind the plug, nudging it or something like that. Um, so, you know, that'd be an example of kind of like knowing they're there at night and they're picky. So what, what are some of the things that you do to kind of turn a finicky fish, a following fish into a fish that actually strikes the lure? Yeah, there are, there's, you get kind of these weird kind of feelings where it's not quite like a hit. I, I think sometimes it's actually a fish following it and then, then spinning around and, and taking off. And it's the, the wake and the disturbance that fish is leaving as it, it you know, decides it doesn't want to bite and hightails out of there. Definitely. They throw that vortex when they turn around and they spin, they decide not to eat and you see it kind of come up to the surface. If you're on a, if you're say fishing a darter, you got a tight line, you've got braid and you're feeling that plug work, that fish turning and throwing that vortex is enough to disrupt the plug and throw slack in it. And you feel something weird and that's, yeah. So what do you do? What do you do to turn that into a strike? Yeah. So the first thing I'd probably do is try a different color. I mean, I, something about that lure got the interest of the fish, you know, whether it's the action or the profile, so I'm going to change up something small about it. You know, I don't want to make a major change. You know, if I have a fish that kind of does that to a darter, I don't want to then switch to a needlefish or a bucktail like that initially. You know, so I'll, I'd take maybe go from a black darter to a, a paracolored darter or a yellow darter and see if the color is what makes the difference. And that's, I was just going to say, and that's something that you've seen, you've seen that work with a color switch. I mean, I, you've done a lot more surf casting than I have, but when I'm out fishing at night, I tend to ignore colors, you know, and probably that's cause like to me, my eyes at night, everything looks close to black or dark. Um, so I really just throw kind of, you know, don't pay attention to color, but you've definitely seen that situation where that has worked just changing color. Yeah, I, I think it does. I, I have had nights where definitely a color change, but it seems like it's a drastic one. You know, I'm not going to go from say a, a blurple, which is just a black over purple to a black, and that's going to make a difference. I don't think that matters at all. But if you're going from a light colored lure, you know, a white, a pink, a, a chartreuse to a dark colored lure, I've definitely seen that make a difference. And it's not not necessarily just the bright nights, bright lures uh, thing. I've seen plenty of dark nights where a brighter or lighter colored lure is going to outfish the dark colored lure. So you just have to have them on hand and try that. That's the first thing I'll try if I'm getting fish that seem like they're, they're there and they're interested, but they're not fully committing. And, and you mentioned that like, uh, you know, thinking it kind of like from a, a scientific point of view, there's so many variables. It's hard to tell, like, you know, if you switch from your yellow darter to your black darter, um, and on the next cast, all of a sudden you get a hit, it could be that color change. It could be that that darter is somewhat different weight to it, or there's some, some slight difference to it that made it swim differently. Um, it could just be chance. It could be that on that retrieve, you had more confidence. You got excited. You're like, okay, this color is going to work now. And maybe you work the plug a little faster or differently. I guess that brings me to my next question is what about changing, you know, um, if you get a follow on a cast or, or you see a fish is interested, you know, they're around, but they're not hitting it. They're being finicky. Do you ever change up the retrieve? Do you do something different with the lure? Oh yeah. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's probably the, even before you change the color, you would, would change up the retrieve a little bit. You know, I, I'd maybe work in a, something that's, if I think a fish is following it, something that's going to trigger it to bite. So either you're, you're giving the rod a big, big pop and that's going to make, you know, with a dart, no matter what you're throwing it, you know, if you give the rod a big pop while you're retrieving, it's going to make the lure you know, skitter to one side or the other. Maybe I'll kill it, stop the retrieve entirely. And with a plug that's going to float to the surface with the jig, it's going to fall back down to the fish's face. That can work a lot. Um, 
you know, yeah, I, I heard Chris talking about on this trip with Joe DiOrio, um, when they first got out there, they were working the dock in kind of different ways. And Joe was hooking up on fish and getting them to hit. And Chris was, you know, that wasn't convincing the fish. And he says, what are we, what are we doing differently? And one of the big things, what Joe was doing differently, you know, with the dock, that's a top water. It's a walk the dog plug. Um, Chris was doing a very rhythmic side, 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 just keeping it very rhythmic. Joe was doing the same thing, but then every few feet would all of a sudden throw in just a long sweep and make that dock that was just going side, 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 all of a sudden just really take a long jaunt in one direction and, and slow down to a stop. And that would trigger the strike. So sometimes it's little things like that. Um, st sticking to the dock, I can think of one day out in my kayak earlier this spring where I threw the dock out, made a long cast, working it through where I thought were fish, not getting a strike and like, okay, there's, you know, maybe I'm not working it right. So as the plug got close to my kayak, I kind of just slowed down and was watching the plug and making sure like trying a different snaps of the rod just to see how it was working. And, you know, 10 feet off my kayak, because I'm playing with the plug, trying to make it work, that's what triggered a fish, which I didn't even realize was behind the plug that triggered it to come in and strike. Um, so that's, you know, I, I guess there's part of the fun of fishing is in working artificial lures is you get all these things you can play with. You can play with the retrieve, play with the color, switch up and try a different lure. Um, so I guess that is my next question. What are your go-to lures, you know, in, in different situations, if you know the fish are there and they're being finicky. Do you think there are certain lures that like are conversion lures that are going to convince a fish to strike in situations, a strike bass to strike when they might otherwise not? I think there's a whole spectrum of, you know, lures that'll work when the fish are in certain moods. I, I think if you take like a big metal lip plug, something that's meant to, to look like a big bait fish, like a bunker, I think that's probably one of the best lures you can throw when the fish are really aggressive, actively feeding, but if the fish are just hunkered down and they're near the bottom, not really chasing bait fish around, I don't think you're going to get a lot of love on that lure. I think that's the situation where you're better off throwing something like a bucktail jig where you're not relying on the fish chasing it. You're using it, or a bucktail jig or a soft plastic, like a soft, long, soft plastic stick bait. I know they've been a longtime favorite of yours uh, catching stripers in the surf, but that's a lure you can put right in the fish's face. You don't need it to, to chase it at all. You, if you know pretty much where the fish are holding, you can put a bucktail jig or a soft plastic jig right, you know, right there. It makes the decision easier for them. Yeah. Like you mentioned, it's, it's different in every situation. Like there are times in the canal where fishing the Cape Cod canal, throwing a pencil popper, the fish are aggressive. They're not finicky at all. You throw that pencil popper because you can cover ground and you'll go get strikes and it's fantastic. There are times when the fish, for whatever reason, their mood, they're not going to come up and hit a pencil popper somebody next to you throwing a, a, say a savage sand eel or a jig or something, they're fishing a little deeper under the surface. They've got that soft plastic. They're just, you know, they're killing fish. Um, I think soft plastics in general, a lot of times, I mean, it depends on the situation and depends on it all, but across all fish species, um, soft plastics just tend to have a lifelike action that a lot of times is just more, you're going to convert strikes, convert finicky fish, striped bass, even bluefish. I've seen it I've been dealing with finicky bluefish that won't hit anything but a soft plastic. It is funny. You feel like they're under contract from some of the uh, soft plastic lure manufacturers when all they'll hit are uh, sluggos and stuff. But yeah. Yeah. And uh, I will, you know, honestly say the Z-Man soft plastics are like the only ones that I've seen that I've fished so far that really stand up to the bluefish attacks. And I've actually used those to target bluefish because the soft plastic action will get them to strike. And, um, yeah, and they could stand up to some of the attacks. I know Hyperlastics is coming out with some tougher soft plastics. And then even in the soft plastics itself, there's that balance between toughness and flexibility. Um, you know, some of the more supple soft plastics have a more lifelike action. So you can get into, you know, really get into the, the weeds there. But um, there's also some, there's also certain plugs, I feel like, that have an action that's more likely to to work with finicky fish. Like, I'll start a lot of times with a, a top water plug, a spook, you know, whether it's a dock or something similar, um, skitter walk by Rapala or some of those different spook type lures. To me, those are great search lures. You can cover a lot of water and they let you know the fish are there because even if they don't hit it and blow up on it, a lot of times they'll get interested and follow it. Um, you know, I've been in a lot of situations where I'll cast out a spook, work it back to the boat. And at some point I see a swirl behind it. I see a fish has followed it. And then I'll just switch that off, go to throwing a fly, going to throw a soft plastic or something instead, but I'm not wasting time with a slow moving lure. I've used that faster walk the dog. 
it's it's something freshwater bass tournament fishermen do all the time. They've got search lures, reaction strike lures, and what do they call it? Finesse lures. So I guess I would put a lot of soft plastics in that like finesse lure type category. Yeah, because you're fishing them so slow, you know, as close to the bottom as you can get in a lot of cases. Well, at least from the surf, from a kayak and from a boat, you know, you can fish them uh, weightless. But yeah, for search lures, at least from shore, you can't beat a good minnow plug like the SP minnow, the uh, the red fin, uh, the Shimano cold sniper. That's a great search lure. Those all, especially the newer ones with the with the internal weights that slide to the back on the cast, they cast a long ways. Very easy to work, and they're going to let you know pretty quickly if fish are around. But I think with when fish are a little bit pickier, I mean, the, there's not a lot of cases where minnow plugs won't work, but they don't work all the time. I think a, a, a lure with a more natural action, like a darter, uh, that's that's a lure that can convert a lot of, of fish that might not hit a more aggressive action of a plug. And the reason I always thought that was is because minnow plugs and a lot of plugs like that with the lips – have an action like a fleeing bait fish, like something that's already being chased. Um, a darter has a very slow kind of methodical action, and that's like a bait fish that doesn't even know the striper's there. And stripers being big time ambush predators, um, I mean, you know, I think that that looks more natural to them. I mean, if you just see a bunker hanging in the current, um, you know, I've watched them off, off bridges, and you just see them, they're not constantly doing this a lot of times they're just kind of slide you know in in a big school just all of them sliding sliding around holding their position in the current and i think that's that to a bass looks more natural than a bait that's completely freaking out right and i think you're you know uh, first of all i'm excited to see you know anybody listening to this to chime in and and throw in some comments and i want to hear about the lures that they use um for when when stripers are finicky if they've ever seen that type of same situation what kind of things they do to get them to hit but You just kind of touched on something there of of what I think about a lot as the difference between fishing versus versus fishing during the day versus fishing at night. It seems like during the day, lures that look like a fleeing fish, um, fleeing bait fish, like a minnow plug are much more effective. Um, If I'm fishing a soft plastic or anything else during the day, I want to make it look like it's trying to get away and it's injured. Um, and, And to me, that's sort of my goal in general when I'm fishing an artificial in the daytime, stripers are hunting a lot by, by vision, but they're kind of on an evil, equal playing field with the bait. Um, it's a lot of pursuit, so they're chasing bait. Nighttime is when striped bass tend to have kind of the advantage. That's why striped bass feed so much more at night. They're a lot less finicky at night, which is another great way to get finicky stripers is to go back to that same area after dark. Um, but at nighttime, they tend to be hunting way more by ambush. The ideal way for a striper to eat a bait at night is to sneak up on it and eat it when it doesn't even suspect, you know, that, that it's being hunted. Yeah. Or better yet, just have it swept past where they're holding in the current too, you know? And that's where, I mean, like in clear, um, like a, a clear sunny day, a darter, I wouldn't really, you know, unless it's, there's some turbulent, turbulent water or there's something other reason for it. But on a regular day, I feel like a darter, if a fish has enough time, if a striped bass has enough time to really look at it, it's not the most realistic looking. It gets a good look at the tackle and all that. You know, I feel like that's not going to be the best at night. Unbelievable. Totally different story. Oh, definitely. Needlefish are another one like that, um, where it's at night, fantastic plug. I know guys do catch them during the day sometimes, but it seems to be a quicker, snappier retrieve. But in the dark, it's great. It has very subtle action. During the daytime, I bet a lot of fish are turning their nose up at that because like you said, you're almost getting reaction strikes from from stripers during the daytime, where they see a bait that's trying to get away, and they want to get it before it can it can get out of their range. Yeah, I had an interesting situation the other day with the bluefish. I was uh, fly fishing for bluefish from the kayak, and y- you never think of bluefish as being picky, but they could actually at some times be really you know tough. And they were doing a lot of I was I was trying to get them on the fly, and they were being really picky. They were following the fly, but they wouldn't hit it. And it basically what it was, was they wanted that fly moving as fast as possible. And that's bluefish for you. I mean, they're super aggressive sometimes. And they, to them, it was sort of like, if they could slow down and take a look at it, it wasn't interesting. But if I could move that fly as fast as possible, and the only way to do that, um, and again, I'm in the uh, Old Town Pedal Kayak, would be to make my cast with the fly, let it land, come tight, start to strip it, put it under my arm and do the two hand strip as fast as I could. And at the same time, pedal backwards. Um, to get that fly moving as fast as possible. I couldn't strip fast enough to get him to hit, but if I pedaled backwards at the same time, 
that'd be enough to trigger them to strike. So sometimes, you know, like, like you're saying that excitement and speed of a fleeing fish. Um, another thing I've, I've noticed is if you get multiple fish in the area, um, a single fish, single striper might follow a lure and be real finicky. But as soon as you introduce some competition, if you've got some smaller fish in the area that are also going for the lure, um, you, you get that sense of competition They're, I think more likely at that point to kind of turn on and start hitting lures and not be finicky. So sometimes it's just a matter of getting more fish involved in the chase. Yeah. And, and waiting them out is, is something you're kind of leading to there. I mean, the current stage is a big thing at slack tide. It may seem like the stripers disappeared. You know, if you've been catching them as the tide's moving and then the tide slows down and goes slack, you know, you may think they moved on to another place. That video, that drone video showed those fish didn't go anywhere. They were exactly where those guys had been catching them on Monday. They just weren't as aggressive. They're waiting for better, better conditions, you know, more advantageous conditions for the stripers to feed. And, you know, talking to Chris and Joe, they said as soon as that tide started going the other direction, picked up speed, bite was right back on. Yeah. Another interesting thing about that, that they were talking about, which, you know, in general, that when the tide picked up, they were, the fish were hitting, but the fact that it was a clear, sunny day the kind of days where you would expect the stripers to be finicky and be picky, they actually weren't. And they said, you know, Joe was saying a big part of that reason was because uh, they're fishing in the Connecticut River. There's some, there was some rain, there was some dirty water coming through. So the water was pretty stained. And they said, you know, you know, Joe was saying if it was clear water, if it wasn't the outgoing tide bringing this water down through the Connecticut River, um, those fish very well could have turned up their noses at everything. They could have spooked at every lure, but because the water was a little stained, and I think that's another thing that a lot of times puts it in the angler's advantage. Anytime visibility is reduced, if it's stained water, if it's cloudy, a cloudy day, a bit of a breeze uh, that puts a chop on the water, or if you're in the surf, even like crashing waves and, and stuff that kind of roils things up. I think all of those kind of less than perfect conditions puts tilts things in the angler's favor. Yeah, exactly. Anything that's not great for swimming or having a beach day is better for catching striped bass. You don't like that one? No, I like that a lot. I like that a lot. Um, but I see that in, you know, that extends to freshwater too. One of my favorite places to fish outside of the striper season is the is the uh, Niagara River out by uh, where you grew up in Buffalo. And on those days when it is crystal clear, visibility is six feet or more, those steelhead, those brown trout, they're incredibly tough to, to get to hit. But there's a sweet spot of it being not too muddy that they can't see it, but just stained enough that those fish are, they're not seeing all your hardware. And those are the days that, you know, if you, if you have days to burn, you know, you, those are conditions you go and you, I try to make the big long ride West. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, definitely. And there's, you know, we're talking about conditions kind of in the, in the places we fish, but then there are also a lot of, a lot of fishermen who purposely target striped bass on clear flats because they enjoy the sight fishing they love going places like, um, like the, on Cape Cod, there's the Brewster flats, uh, the Monomoy flats. There's a lot of these places around the vineyard as well, where part of the fun is the fact that, you know, you're going to encounter fish that you can see, um, if you're not careful enough, they can see you and you're kind of purposely getting yourself in this scenario where you're going to have finicky fish, where they're going to be likely to spook, where you really have to, you know, it's part of the game, um, come up with a fly or whatever you're using that looks realistic. Um, and you know, it's, it's a test. It's a way of kind of taking these fish and making them even harder to catch. And I know there's a lot of guys who enjoy that. I get it. It's exciting and fun to be able to see fish and fun to be able to, you know, conquer that challenge of dealing with super picky stripers on the flats. Yeah. There's just so many ways to catch stripers. It's uh, to be able to fish them like you would bone fish, you know, or red fish down South, you know, that sight casting to them is, is awesome. And it is, I've tried it. I've not had a lot of success with it. Uh, but I definitely see the appeal. So, so one last thing I wanted to talk about is, is you mentioned right in the very beginning, you said you feel like this spring, you've kind of heard more about it than ever before. Um, it's something that, you know, I, on my local waters, I've been encountering for the past few years, this particular scenario where inshore, so in a kind of like a, a bay or a harbor type area, um, running into big stripers that seem like they're just resting. And actually I was saying stripers bluefish it's a very similar behavior being in the kayak i run into it a lot because the fish are right under the surface and i don't I, the reason i know they're there is because i spook them and they swirl and take off um but fishing and they 
they just seem to be, you know, I've, I've heard people describe them as sunbathing or with bluefish, they say like, oh, they're digesting their meals or something like that. I'm seeing that, I think, more often now with striped bass and with bluefish. And and my theory is that these are fish that are eating bunker, eating menhaden. And during the day, they basically have their fill. They've got, you know, and, and, and so maybe that's why we're seeing more of it. There's more bunker, there's more menhaden around they eat a big meal. They're eating a lot of, they, they, they have as much food as they want really during the day when it's much harder for them to hunt that bunker, they can just kind of sit and relax and maybe it is digest. Maybe it is find warm water that helps them digest their food, but whatever it is, they'll just kind of sit there and hang out. Um, and I've heard of that a lot in different areas of, um, Buzzards Bay up here at Cape Cod and other places. I've seen it definitely on the South side of the Cape, these fish just hanging out. I saw it in Narragansett Bay this year, uh, was out on a trip and saw, you know, bass that would follow our bunker in, you know, bass that were just kind of hanging around, but not, would not commit, would not eat. Yeah. When they won't even eat a live bunker. I mean, that's, that's crazy. You think that. Or a chunk. I mean, we tried chunks. We tried everything that day and the bass just would not eat. And we knew they were there. We saw them on the surface, saw them on the electronics, but they, they just, they can't eat all the time. You know, they can't just constantly uh, as much as we like to think they're out there just gorging themselves 24 you seven, know, like anything, they, they are, you said, they're probably hunkering down, just digesting. And pro- I also think waiting for uh, better conditions to go feed. Yeah. And it's definitely a big fish thing too. It seems like schoolies and smaller stripers, uh, they're willing to, you know, they're, they're less likely to be picky. They're going to go out, run around and eat when they can bigger fish. Um, I know it bugs you when anybody calls striped bass lazy. It's not that big striped bass are lazy. It's that big striped bass are smart, or at least they know there's no point in burning energy to run around chasing bunker when it's going to be really hard for them to catch it uh, or any prey. They're going to kind of wait until the conditions are in their favor. And during that time, if they're sitting in a, you know, sitting in an area, uh, sitting in a shallow bay or something and kind of resting, relaxing, they're not going to go after a plug and chase it because, you know, it's not worth the time to them. They know that they've got easy conditions and an easy meal coming up if they just kind of wait for whatever magic set of conditions it is that are perfect for them. So one last thing that you mentioned, um, asking what I would do when I encounter finicky fish is, you know, say I've changed the lure, I've changed the color. I go back and forth on whether I think adding scent to the lures uh, makes any difference. Um, it, it's another one of those things where it's tough to get concrete evidence on whether it worked you know there's so many other things that could have gone into play that had nothing to do with the fact that i have a little squirt bottle full of bunker oil that i just sprayed into the you know all over the plug actually i'm more likely to do it on plugs with dress tail hooks because i feel like they they absorb the uh, the scent a little bit better hang on to it a little bit longer rather than just spraying it onto the wood um but that is one of the things i try if i'm getting bumps and the fish aren't committing put, put some scent on there I think there's times that that's made a difference, you know, where I'll, I'll, I'll sweeten up the plug a little bit and then maybe you're getting some of those bumps turn into actual bites. But I don't know if that's more a confidence builder for me than it is convincing the fish. You know, that's- it makes sense. I would think, you know, definitely scent makes a difference. Um, you know, it, it's certainly, you know, striped bass certainly have the ability to pick up that scent. Um, so it, it would make sense to me. It just comes down to, you know, I don't carry bunker oil because it's like one more thing I don't want to deal with. I feel like I've got other options of, of different things to try, but it might be, you know, there could be a moment where that is the key. Um, I mean, there's so many, there's so many things we haven't even talked about your leader. Um, the fact that striped bass could be line shy and sometimes going to a, a lighter leader or a fluorocarbon leader, that could be the difference that turns on these fish. I guess it's, uh, you know, I guess that's, we're coming back around to like the whole point in the whole fun of fishing is you can kind of tweak all these variables. It's sort of an infinite combination. Every cast, every lure, every time you throw it to a fish, it's going to be a little bit different in some, some way. Um, and so it's just part of cracking the code, trying these different things, trying different lures, different variables, and, and figuring out what cracks the code and what gets a striped bass to hit. Can I say a little bit more on scent? I would, I would love that. <laughs> So as much as, you know, the other, the other side of using scents for stripers is also masking scents. Um, you know, whether there's something that's on the plug, could be sunscreen, could be, you know, whatever, the ham sandwich you eat for lunch on the boat, something that the striper smells and does not, and turns it off eating that plug. That could be another. Is that why you smelled like bunker yesterday? Was that, are you masking your own scent? 
<laughs> yes, yes, of, of masking my ham sandwiches. Um, you did have a strong bunker smell yesterday. Where did that come from? Uh, I, there's a couple places. I, I forgot about a little bit of bait in the truck, and also I was I had a clog the night. You know, I, I was fished in the early morning yesterday, and I had a clog in my bunker oil squirt bottle, and I I, I poked it with the hook, and then it, it came out. And I kind of bathed myself in it. So it could have been one of those two things. The fact I've been marinating in rotten bunker smell in my car or that I'm actively uh, pouring my bunker oil on myself. It's been, uh, you know, it's the June new moon. If you're going to go hard at all this season, this is the uh, this is the time to do it. Yeah. And your coworkers pay the price. <laughs> at least there's no eels in the fridge. All right. Well, we've thrown out a lot of theories here on how to deal with finicky and picky stripers, but we want to hear what you guys out there think. So definitely let us know, put it up in the comments. So it gives us something to talk about next time. Let us know what lures do you use or what do you do when you can't fool a striper into, into striking. Um, and definitely make sure you subscribe. We're going to be doing these every week. So keep in touch, subscribe, like, smash. Ooh, don't smash. Don't smash. You can stop and subscribe.